Hey everybody, welcome back to yet another video. Today, I wanted to dive in and talk about um, my top five tone tips for getting great tone out of our Line 6 Helix HX Stomp. Actually, a lot of these will apply to any modeler and any guitar amp at all. Um, <clears throat> you know, I get a lot of comments and a lot of discussions with people talking about, you know, constantly going on about how they can get their helix to sound better, how they get in their amps to sound better, how they can just get better tone. And I wanted to talk about a few of these things that I use on a regular basis and they're always in the back of my mind when I'm creating tones for studio, for live, or even when I'm just playing. Now these aren't in any particular order of importance. I think they all can work cumulatively to provide us a better outcome when we're creating our tone. So without further ado, here is number one. We don't want to make our tone too dark sounding. Now, I'm actually quite a fan of tones that lend themselves, sort of lean over more to the darker side of the tone spectrum. Uh, I've never been a fan of super harsh tones. Having said that though, <clears throat> If you have any experience in the recording studio or even playing live or doing live sound or having your sound cut through in a way that it sits in the mix properly, we have to be very careful not to cut out too much of the upper mids or even high end. One of the top things we see and top uh, things discussed when referring to creating tones for the Helix and I, and I imagine even for other modelers <clears throat> is to use high cuts, right? And you see all sorts of opinions about it. Some people say, yeah, high cut it down to 10 kilohertz. Some people high cut down to three kilohertz, right? Now, obviously that really is going to depend on what you start with, right? Uh, if you're using a ribbon mic versus a, a dynamic mic like an SM57, that's obviously going to uh, you know, influence how far you wanna go with your cuts. If you've dialed in a super bright tone and a super bright amp, yeah, maybe you do have to cut it lower. So I'm not here to tell you particularly that it should be set at a perfect, you know, ideal spot that is going to be the same for everything. In fact, I think that's impossible. But just to be more mindful of the fact not to roll it off too much. Now, one thing that happens is people listen maybe through their FRFR monitor or their studio monitors at the guitar sound by itself. So they make it you know, a certain level of darkness, let's call it. Uh, smoothness, maybe. <clears throat> and they're very happy with that sound, and it sounds more, you know, amp in the room to them. And then they go to record with it, or they go to play live, and all of a sudden they're going, man, I, I really can't, I don't have any presence in the mix, I can't really hear myself, and I gotta turn myself up, I feel like I have to turn the volume up quite high, and then I kinda get to the point where now it's just too loud, but it's still not cutting through in the mix, now it's just kinda sitting above everything, right? You'll be very surprised, and a lot of folks have probably done this, but if you can search around and find, you know, stem mixes of original, you know, classic songs, um, you'll be surprised if you can isolate the guitars a lot of times that they're not what you envision them to be soloed as you thought they were in the final mix. A lot of times, there's a lot more, uh, dare I say, harshness to the sound, which actually allows the engineer to kind of bring it back in the mix and let it sit properly while those upper end frequencies kind of help it to cut through the mix if that makes sense, okay? So it is really gonna be about experimenting, but I guess what I could say, if you're finding that your tones aren't cutting through the mix, maybe try taking that high cut and rolling it a little bit higher until, just until the point where you don't feel like it's getting harsh, but maybe you feel like it's just cutting through the mix a little bit better. Uh, maybe don't cut any upper mids out as much. Maybe just bring those back up in the mix. Always test things sort of in the mix or, you know, whether it be a band practice or live or just even recording. Uh, layering other guitars and seeing how everything sits with bass drums, keyboards and whatnot. Now having said that too, if you're in a very um, non-dense mix, and what I mean by that is let's say we're just playing over top of drums and bass. Well, there's going to be less frequencies to cut through and compete with. So we may be able to go with slightly darker tone, right? But as we add more elements, maybe there's, there's keyboards and string pads or, or synth pads, uh, piano, horns, other guitars, we may need more of that upper end 
sonic material to help us sort of cut through the mix so that we don't have to be sitting on top of it to be heard, if that makes sense. Now then there's the other side of it, that if you're just playing in your room through the speaker system, what does it matter? Roll that back to however much you need it to, to get to the point where you hear what you want to hear. But just so that we are able to cover all the bases, that's one tip that I think is very important. Now, this next tip I think is really important, and some folks might say, well, this doesn't have anything to do with dialing in sounds, and I never said this would. Don't play too loud, and this kind of goes hand in hand with, in fact, these first three tips are gonna kind of work in conjunction with one another. A lot of guitar players, we're notoriously bad for playing very, very loud, right? <clears throat> so, we, we grab our guitar, we turn up, we wanna hear ourselves, we wanna hear ourselves. But again, this goes back to what I just said. If we've dialed in a tone that is so dark and lacking any sort of presence to cut through the mix, we're going to want to go and turn that up to the point where, yeah, there I am, I hear myself now. To what detriment though? Well, possibly ruining the stage volume, the mix volume, uh, not being able to balance the sound within a studio mix, you know? So, a lot of times, the reason we feel we need to play so loud is because we're not feeling our presence of our guitar tone in the mix, right? So going back again, if we create the right settings, instead of turning up, try maybe rolling up those high cuts so that we're not cutting out as much information or bringing in some of the upper mids back into our tone. Not to the point of them being harsh, but just to the point of them sitting in the mix properly. So really try, instead of reaching for the volume knob, reach for the EQ tools that we've talked about, and that might help solve some of our problems. This next tip also works hand in hand with what I was just talking about as well. Um, you know, where our ears are in relation to our monitoring system is going to be an important point. Um, now, I hear a lot of folks say, wow, that, that particular tone sounds really harsh, but yet they hear it in a mix and it works really well. If we're standing in front of an FRFR monitor, wedge monitor, let's say, pointing right up to our face, well, we're kind of right in the line of fire. Our ears are getting kind of assaulted with this tone. This is no different than if you were playing through a real tube amp, through a real guitar cabinet. If we lower our ears right down to the level <clears throat> of the guitar speaker, we're going to get hit with a whole lot of those so-called harsh frequencies, kind of upper mid things, that actually maybe are helping it to sit and cut through the mix, but we don't listen to guitar speakers like that. Now, you know, one real eye-opener for me was many, many, many years ago when I was playing real amps, and I'm talking many years ago when I was a teenager, the first time I ever tilted my guitar back on, a, on, a, on an amp stand I kind of went, whoa, what the heck happened to my tone? Everything sounds absolutely horrible. Now, it had all that harshness in the upper end, and I just thought, this is terrible, right? And, and then I started, and it was something I couldn't dial up. Well, no, now I was getting hit straight in the ears, right? Straight in the face, or back of the head, or whatever, with this direct sound coming in the speaker cabinet. And a lot of times the people who talk about amp in the room sound, you know, a lot of times that sound is simply the, the speaker cabinet blowing all those frequencies and all that sound, you know, by our pant legs at ankle or calf level, right? And we don't get that harshness. We think, oh, listen to how great and, and smooth this tone sounds. And as soon as we throw a microphone in front of it, all of a sudden we go, that wasn't my tone. That doesn't sound anything like what I was hearing. Well, no, because the microphone is right in that line of fire. So if we are standing or tilting our FRFR monitor back, something like a power cap, tilting it back so it's hitting us right in the ears, or we're using an FRFR monitor that's pointed right up at our face, standing right in front of that, you probably likely will end up dialing in very dark tones that may not cut in the mix. So a lot of times what I suggest and what I even practice is, I try to not stand right in the line of fire of my monitoring system. I try to be slightly off axis on it so that it's not hitting me right in the, in the face or in the ears, right? And so finding a sweet spot like that where we're not gonna get, now obviously there's gonna be people who, people who use in-ear monitors, but my previous tips would work with that as well. You know, dial in the upper mids and the high end uh, to get it to cut in the mix and then just bring your volume back appropriately. You're still going to cut, but it's going to sit in the mix. You're going to be part of the mix rather on top, than on top of the mix. But for folks that are struggling that they say, well, if I dial myself in to get to the point of cutting through the mix, well, now it sounds really harsh to me. 
step away. Maybe position yourself differently so that you're not getting the brunt of it, much like you would with a real amp where you don't sit down with your ear up against the speaker cone, or even a few inches back or a few feet back with our ears right in line with it, right? So that's just things I've found. Again, you know what? These are my opinions. Some folks may find their mileage may vary, but I find these things have helped and I hope they help you too. All right, for the next tip, I want to talk about something that may not be too obvious to some folks, and that is this little guy right here. How we pick on our guitar, what our picking technique is like. I think this is an oftentimes, over, oftentimes overlooked, or underlooked, I don't know <laughs> however you want to put it, uh, element that people leave out. And one of the reasons why you know, if I played a tone with this guitar and handed it to a different player, why that sound is going to be so much different. You know, probably both hands have a lot to do with it, but I find the pick is very important. What I have seen is people take, you know, tones maybe that I've dialed in and, you know, uh, they grab it and they play something along these lines. Uh, I don't think anybody's gonna really think that that sounds great. You know, I'm slamming the, the snot of the strings. If I play those same chords, but do it more like this. Versus. The tone is changing, you know? So what are some of the things that I can do pick-wise to kind of improve my tone? Well, one thing is, staying very relaxed. And in all my years of teaching, one thing I notice is a lot of tensions in people's picking hands. And even in a lot of clips I watch people playing online, they're constantly digging in. There's no dynamics to their playing. And they're kind of sucking the life out of the tone just by the velocity that they're constantly hitting the strings with. Now, we can hit the strings hard sometimes, but when that's intermixed with more dynamic style playing and a more relaxed feel, and even when I hit the strings hard, stay relaxed with it. <laughs> I used one very hard hit there and then followed it up with some more soft dynamic playing, which I think really improves the tone. We can also vary the amount of gain we get out of a tone by picking harder or softer or even using my fingers sometimes. In between, I'll use hybrid picking. So. playing just improves because we add so much dynamics to it and it's a lot more interesting to listen to. What are other things we can do with our pick? Well, where we pick in relation to the bridge versus the neck as well. As I play a note here, if I pick back by the bridge, I'm getting kind of a thinner tone. Watch as I move my pick forward. dramatic tone difference we get simply by moving our pick around. So again, if we're playing with a particular tone,
if we practice that and get very used to what each sort of different little segment along the string sounds like as far as our pick goes, then all of a sudden we have these tools and we know in advance what it's going to sound like when I move around. It gives us another tool in our toolkit for great tone, but just in our hands. And this applies to tube amps, to any modeler, or the Helix or the HX Stomp. What about the angle of the pick as well? You can kind of see, you know, a lot of times you can pl play at an angle. Let me go from flat to angled and listen to the tone difference. This is very flat. Listen as I angle the pick. get a bit of a pick scrape in there that adds to the tone or subtracts from the tone depending on what we want. And again, if we just practice these techniques, aggressive there, kind of that Stevie Ray Vaughan style of just muting everything. I didn't touch the tone, it was all in my hands and fingers. So picking technique, those are a few of the things. The volume we hit at, where we hit at, the angle we hit at, all of those things, if we keep mindful of those and practice those, we can alter our tone quite nicely with nothing but our hands. All right, the final tip I wanted to talk about is proper pickup selection. Now, proper pickup selection, proper is kind of up to our own, uh, you know, personal preference and opinion. But what I mean by that is, you know, we can listen to a tone. Now this guitar here, before I say that, has a Seymour Duncan humbucker, which I can do split coil on. Also has a Seymour Duncan P90 in it, in the neck pickup. There's a lot of tonal possibilities here. So, the, by the way, the preset that I've been using here is my Line 6 Market Plate Ar Place Archon Ultimate preset. Um, and this is the uh, push to uh, snapshot, I believe. A <clears throat> little bit of breakup, a little bit of drive. Dialed in to really sound nice in a mix and cut through without any anything else. But here's the thing, I could play this on the humbucker pickup. <laughs> Some folks might say, oh, that, that just kind of sounds too thin maybe, but that's going to work really nicely when we uh, need it to cut through a mix. I happen to think it sounds nice and balanced anyway. But here's the thing, when I switch this over to the neck pickup, that tone changes dramatically. Now if I had dialed that tone in to be really dark and fat on the bridge pickup, then likely when I switched over to the neck pickup, it was probably going to be very muddy sounding. But in this case, it's balanced. So I can go from here, using proper picking technique, 
Get something that's gonna cut through the mix. And then here. Something that is beefy and fat. I didn't have to change the preset. And that's how those are dialed in specifically like that to be able to sound good across a wide array of guitars and a wide array of pickup selections. So if I go back to the bridge and switch it to single coil mode. Then I could combine the humbucker with the P90. Or the single coil humbucker with the P90. Or the, uh, just the neck pick. So here's all our possibilities from humbucker, neck, middle position with neck uh, and bridge. So the rule here that I'm getting at, not, I don't want to say rule, but you know, if we sometimes dial things in on one pickup to sound a certain way, it may be discounting it from sounding good on other pickup settings. So instead, let's try to make it work across all the different pickup selectors of various guitars and embrace the qualities of that preset, such as, yeah, maybe on the bridge it's going to sound a little thinner. You know, by design, so it cuts through the mix and sounds great. And then we have this also at our disposal if we need it. So, what do you folks think? Those are my top tone tips, again, that I find really help me to come up with tones that work uh, in a variety of situations, both live. Uh, mix ready in the studio with very little need to ever go outside of that and tweak anything after the fact. You know, for, for, for instance, all my marketplace presets or all my custom tone presets and dialing in videos, there's absolutely no processing after the fact on those. Those are how they're dialed in in the Helix to sound that way to work in the mix. And those are some of the tools that I use. But also some interesting tips as far as why when we hear one player play it versus another, why we might be hearing a difference. Another good thing to keep in mind is the use of our volume control as well, right? A little tweak back on the volume. things clean up nicely as well. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. I hope some folks got some useful tips out of it and try some of those tips with your own playing and your own uh, tone creation. And I hope that gets you a step closer to sort of your sonic nirvana, if, uh, if that's such a thing. All right, thank you guys so much for tuning in. I will be back soon with some more content. Please like the video and share it if you don't mind and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and hit the little bell notification so you get to see when I uh, put up new videos. Thanks again, guys. I will be back soon. Ciao for now.